Okay, so welcome to our final assembly of 2020-2021. Great to be here with you, albeit virtually, and hopefully this is the last one of these. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Marie Curie today, just to kind of give us a theme, because our Curie chapter, which is, of course, mostly associated with our sixth form, uh, and we should talk more about our sixth form, really. So I'm keen to talk about these chapters. Uh, I didn't name this chapter Curie. We, this, this has been here since the Academy opened. Maybe some of the teachers that have been here a while will tell you why. But Curie, Marie Curie, is a fascinating character. And she's a good person to think about um, in these times that we're living in. She's a really good person to think about. And obviously representative of our sixth form. So I want everyone thinking about our sixth form. Uh, and I think... Marie Curie has a good message about why we should be thinking about our sixth form as well. So she is responsible for one of my favourite quotes, and I, I think it's very linked to education. Here's the quote. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. I'll give it to you again. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. So again, you can hear that whole Curie thing coming through, very much a Sir Robert Woodard theme, the idea of fear less, attributed to Miss Barr as well, I think, the whole team fearless. Uh, and I, I basically, at, at her core, Marie Curie was about education, learning more, knowing more, as a way to take away fear and anxiety, just to understand. And really, for me, that's one of the main things that school can do for you. And one of the re main reasons that I like to think that we stay on a real academic pathway for as long as possible. That's why I'm keen for you all to go to our sixth form. Because the more you understand, the less you need to fear of the world. Let me give you a few facts about her. She's, she's, a, she's a great inspiration to us in education. Born in Poland, 1867. Uh, basically grew up to be one of the most noteworthy scientists of all time. Uh, few facts, few fun facts. Her parents were teachers, science teachers. Uh, she was the fifth child uh, of her family. Um, received a pretty decent education at school and at home. You know, her dad was pretty good in particular at teaching her about science. Uh, when she graduated from high school at 15, she was top of her class. Uh, and, you know, obviously a very intelligent woman. She wants to go to university to study science at the University of Warsaw, which would have been, you know, a pretty prestigious university in Poland at the time. Uh, unfortunately, in 1867, it was illegal for women in Poland to uh, obtain a higher diploma in education. Uh, so she went to somewhere called the Flying University, which sounds a bit mad. And the Flying University, the, the idea behind it was quite interesting. It was to avoid the authorities, they would set up shop in one area, carry out research, science, higher learning, all the usual things you'd expect from university. And then they would just change location uh, every few months. So, th so I think what I'm taking from, so if I say the first part is using education as a way of being fearless. The second thing I, I, that she inspires me with is this idea of, like, imagine it's illegal. It's illegal to go to university uh, if you're a woman. And that didn't stop her. That did not stop her. So she, she found the flying university. She went there with her sister. Uh, she did very well, uh, and then in 1891 she moved to Paris and went to the Sorbonne, which is a very famous university in France. So, overcoming adversity, something that we could all take from Marie Curie, being told that she couldn't go to university, didn't stop her, ended up at one of the best universities in the world. Uh, she didn't waste that education, she went on to win two Nobel Prizes for science, two. Uh, and she's the only person to this day who's won two Nobel Prizes in two different sciences. Uh, she was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1903 uh, for her work around radioactivity. And she won the second one in 1911, which was, you know, almost an even bigger deal for the discovery of radium and polonium. So radium, I think, comes from the Latin for ray, and polonium was a nod to her home country, Poland. So two Nobel Prizes for science, so she didn't waste her, uh, her education. Quite an innovative character. Amazingly interested in what she went on to, went on to achieve. Uh, so, 
highly successful, excellent scientist. Um, next bit. When she was discovering these elements in the periodic table, and at some stage all of you will engage with the periodic table at school, uh, so think about it when you see radium and polonium, to, to prove the existence of those elements, they, her husband and, and, and Marie Curie had to kind of work in this kind of grotty old shed on the school site where he was teaching, and they were basically melting down ore into chemical components. So it was real physical graft. They didn't necessarily have like modern labs, all the things that science and big kind of companies would have to offer. So they were just working it out, working really hard, difficult circumstances, they just kept going. So again, just that example of overcoming adversity, uh, which makes her for me a real inspirational figure. Um, loads of interesting stuff. I mean, her work around radioactivity, I mean, just practical applications. Uh, she developed, she, you know, she lived through World War One, right, which is just a, what must, that must have been just such a traumatic kind of thing for the world, which it obviously was. But what did she do in that scenario? She took her academic prowess and her knowledge of uh, radium and, and, and invented uh, a mobile x-ray machine so that we literally were able to take it into the battlefield, diagnose issues and you know, help soldiers in the field. So she was very practical when she had to be, and she was able to use her uh, knowledge to, to good effect in that way. She also set up lots of kind of institutes for research that survive to this day. So some of the best cancer research uh, that goes on is, is in the Institute uh, Marie Curie, and that, that's still present today. So she's had a long reaching effect. Kind of tragic that it was actually, um, her exposure to radium over a prolonged period of time that, that led to her early death, quite sad, but just shows you how fearless she really was. You know, she really was on the edge of everything she did. But all these years later, the reason we're talking about Marie Curie is, well, one, because she's the figure that we take as, 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 as the ideal for academic study, thinking about sixth form, all those things. She's an inspirational character. She's an inspiration to everyone who believes in education because she talks about education as a way of developing meaning and understanding of the world. Uh, huge but humble ambition. You know, like what she achieved in her lifetime is absolutely incredible. And there's two things really there, the hard work and really the ability to overcome adversity the ability to overcome adversity. So I think we've had a little taste this year of someone saying, we're gonna take things away from you. And in our own small way, we've overcome adversity big time at this school this year. We've kept our education going. Your attendance online throughout the lockdowns has been nothing short of inspirational. So I hope uh, there's a little bit of Curie in the building. Certainly that spirit has been shown by all of you this year. Um, so that's just a little bit more about Marie Curie, uh, incredible character. And, and, and I am actually very inspired by how well you've all done this year in showing that ability to overcome adversity, which is so important on the road to success. So nothing more to say from me other than have a great summer. Uh, if you are in that minority of students who doesn't read regularly, you must try and read at least one or two books over the summer. Many of you here are reading well above your reading age, so many, and you will keep reading anyway. If you are one of those children who says, has decided at an early age that you don't read regularly, you're the ones that I'm speaking to, please just pick up a book over the summer. Don't let your brain fall out your, out your ears. Yeah, you have to kind of keep these things going. Your brain is a muscle like anything else. So a little bit of work and something to read. We always talk about reading for pleasure at our school. So read something that you're gonna to want to read. Uh, and you know, give yourself a, a reasonable target for reading over the summer. If you're coming to our summer schools, well done, that's great, but everybody deserves a good rest uh, and we'll look forward to things getting back to, on a more normal footing, I suppose, from September. Uh, we will be testing you back in just on a practical note, so don't worry about that. Uh, but after that, we were you know, hoping to uh, dispense with bubbles and back to normal life at Sir Robert Wood Art Academy. Have a brilliant summer. You have been so good this year and I'm looking forward to uh, all the amazing things we're gonna bring back next year and achieve together. Well done, have a great summer. Hello everyone. I wanted to take a couple of minutes to um, announce to you all um, our new year 11, as they will be in September, our new year 11 student leaders. Um, we had a, a number of students apply for this role 
um, an important role at our academy to um, support the school, to support the students in this school in a variety of different ways. And I'm pleased to announce um, and award their senior student ties today. So, here they are. Well done to these individuals. Uh, they've all stepped up and uh, taken on um, a responsibility within our academy and we need to be grateful to them. Um, I think we'll agree all of these students have shown um, an excellent commitment to their learning and an excellent commitment to their own education moving forward. Um, can I ask these guys now to head down to the Year 10 chapter base where you can collect your prefect tie. I hope that you wear it with pride. What a beautiful day! Say that that's impossible That you and I would never look back And wasn't it incredible So beautiful and above all Just to see the fuse get lit this time To light a real bonfire for all time And what a beautiful day To be back Well, Heffern said I love you And Flynn said make mine a double jack We then we planned a revolution To make things better for all time Oh, and Guevara said that's crazy And ordered up a bottle of wine What a beautiful day
principal awards to this summer. Um, first one is just going back to my Marie Curie, that little bit extra, uh, overcoming adversity and just being curious. The first one goes to a year eight student who uh, knows how much she did in terms of a very difficult workshop we did around um, public speaking and debating. Kind of just went that extra mile and solved a very complicated crossword. So Amy Saunders in year eight, uh, well done to you. You definitely get my principal's reward for Key Stage 3. Uh, you've done exceptionally well this year and I've been asking about you in all of your lessons. Incredibly good. Uh, and then my second uh, Head Teacher's Award goes to somebody who uh, is having a massive impact on the school just through sheer leadership uh, qualities and potential. Really thinking about others and how they can make the school a better place and stepping up in that regard. So Lewis Power, really impressed with you this year. You've had, a, you've had a great year. You've got enormous potential. And what I like most about you, Lewis, what, what I find most impressive is just how much you think about your fellow students and want to improve things for them. And that's just an enormous uh, attribute. It's a, re a real sign of leadership. So well done, Lewis, and well done, Amy. Have a great summer. Thanks. Hello everybody, I'd like to take a minute quickly just to introduce myself. My name's Lewis, I'm a Year 13 student at W6 and beginning next year I'm going to be the head student. So as I'm sure many of you are aware, there have been some hefty changes to the student leadership within the academy, including the addition of a student council as well as student representatives of each year. Now, whilst these changes may seem daunting at first, they're a great opportunity for us students, allowing our voice to be heard within the academy and to those in more senior positions. And it's my honour, as head student, to play a role in these changes, representing the ideas, needs and desires of the student body and ensuring our voice is heard. I've been at the Academy for six years now and I can honestly say it's been a great experience and nobody has forced me to say this. But from the teaching to the facilities, it's just been great. And I know that together we can make it better and hopefully get everybody to share that view. Anyway. That's me. I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. Hopefully I haven't rambled on too much. But I can't wait to see you guys in person and work together to make the Academy a better place. What keeps us healthy and happy as we go through life? If you're going to invest now in your future self, where would you put your time and energy? There was a survey of recently of millennials asking them what their most important life goals were. Over 80% said a major life goal was for them to be rich. Another 50% of those same young people said that another major life goal was to become famous. Welcome to my happy place. Outdoors, nature, the sound of birds in the trees, a bit of peace. Today we're told to work hard and to push hard and to achieve more. And we're given the impression that these things uh, are the things that will give us a good and healthy life. But imagine if you could watch entire lives as they unfolded through time. What if we could study people from the time that they were teenagers all the way through to old age to see what really keeps people happy and healthy. Well, it's good to know that someone did it and they're still doing it. Way back when, 84 years ago, the Harvard University in America studied adult development for the longest adult study ever, still going on. They've tracked the lives of 725 people year after year, asking about their work, their home lives, their health, and of course, asking all along this, not knowing how their stories are gonna turn out about 60 of them uh, are left alive. Still participating in the study, most of them in their late 90s. When they entered the study, all of these people way back then in the 30s were, as teenagers, were interviewed. They were given medical exams. They went to their homes and interviewed their parents. And then these teenagers grew up into adults who entered all walks of life. Some became factory workers, others doctors, bricklayers, lawyers. One of them even became the President of the United States. Some developed a dependency on alcohol, some developed major mental health illnesses, some climbed the social ladder from the bottom all the way to the top, bearing in mind they came from different aspects of society, and some made the journey from the top to the bottom. And every two years, people were sent forms, researchers went round to visit and asked them questions about their lives. What have they learned? 
all these years? What are the lessons that have come out of 10,000 pages of information on all this data that's been generated about these lives? Is it about wealth or fame? It wasn't. Was it about striving to work harder and harder that kept them healthy and kept them happier? It wasn't. There are three main messages from this study that I believe that we could embrace. And the core heading of this is good relationships keep us happier and healthier. Full stop. They learned three lessons about relationships. They learned that the first is social connections are really good for us. It may, may seem like, yeah, we know that. But do we? Do we know that the people we're with, the ones that make us laugh, the ones we're honest with, the ones that encourage us, actually help us be happier and live longer? Because they discovered loneliness actually kills. It turns out that people who are more socially connected to family or to friends or to a community are happier. They're physically healthier. They live longer than people that are less well connected. And the experience of loneliness turns out to be toxic and poisonous. People who are more isolated than they want to be from others find that they are less happy. Their health declines earlier and their brain function starts to decline and they live shorter lives. The sad fact is that at any given time, more than one in five people will report that they're lonely. We can be lonely in a crowd, of course, and you can be lonely in a relationship. So the second big lesson that they learned was it's not just the number of friends you have, and it's not just whether or not you're in a committed relationship, but it's the quality of those close relationships that matters. Those people whose head you put on your shoulder, who you will tearfully explain some of your pain with, those people that you trust, those people that make you laugh. In situations where there's no affection, there's continual conflict in relationships, in friendships, is bad for our health. Living in the midst of good, warm relationships is protective. Maybe that's why we feel so down when we row and we have bitter arguments. And the final big lesson they learned about relationships and our health is that good relationships, they don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains. And we're discovering so much more about our brains. Being in a securely attached relationship to another person in your 80s, they found, is protecting people who are in those relationships, knowing that they can count on somebody else in a time of need. These people, where they tested them, their memories were sharper and they lasted longer. It's relationships where people, they couldn't count on each other. Those were the people, and they did it for a CAT scans of the brain, where memory, memory started to decline. Those good relationships don't have to be smooth all the time, but it's knowing there's someone there. It's knowing that you can reach out to someone. If you can count on someone, when the going gets tough, those people brought on an increased improvement in memory and mental health. So all that survey, all that energy, following people's lives into their 90s, we can genuinely now say we know that relationships, good, close relationships, are great for our health. They're great for our well, uh, well-being. And it's as wisdom as all the hills, but why don't we get it sometimes? Well, we're human, we want the quick flick fix. We want something sorted now, something that'll make our lives good and instant straight away. But of course, relationships are messy. They're complicated and they're hard work. We need to learn to lean into our friendships lean into our family, lean into our friends and our community. That means go to them for support, go to them for encouragement, go for them to them help. And of course, we've got to flip that. We need to be there for our friends, for our family. Be patient, be listeners, be encouragers. So what can we do? We might have to reduce our screen time to hang out with people more face to face. We might liven up some of the relationships we're in by doing something different, something new, longer walks, date nights, conversations, swimming in the sea, maybe ringing up a family member you haven't seen for years. Because those family feuds that are in our history, they can take a terrible toll on those that hold grudges against other people. Life is short. Bickering and bitterness, hate and hurt has now been proven to make life shorter trusting and calling out on friends and family, spending time listening to each other, laughing together, walking together, being, not just doing, are not only good for today, but they are so, so good for tomorrow and a longer tomorrow. This year has been so hard for so many. Maybe we've got close to people and so we can find some good in all this pain. Maybe we feel lonely and full of fear but this summer is a chance to reach out for help, to meet up and hang out with family and with friends. Some of you will be organisers and will call together groups. Others of you will be turner-uppers and enjoy what's been organised. 
but this is our chance this summer to learn from all of the pain of this year and to convert that into an opportunity to laugh together, to be honest together, to build even stronger and greater relationships with each other so that we can come back in September with good foundations, recognising that we need to forgive more, we need to be hopeful more often and we need to put our trust in the friends and the family that are around us. I read this study and I've been studying this study, finding out fascinating things. And I've always had a mantra, three F's mantra, that, that make up my life. And, and, and I'll leave this with you as you go on to your summer holidays. For me, the most important things in my life are my family, the first F. My incredible friends that I have the privilege of hanging out with. And then for me, my faith. A faith which is about a relationship. I hope and pray this summer you'll make some great relationships. You'll develop even stronger uh, relationships with your family and trust and that you will know that you're investing in some really important thing like relationships for a stronger, healthier and happier future. God bless your summer, have the most amazing break, you deserve it. And I look forward to seeing you all in September. Take care. <laughs>